this is John chapter 1 and verse number 29. The Bible says this. The next day John seeth Jesus coming and said unto him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. May we pray. Father, it's a blessing to be here today. We thank you for the mercy and the grace of God. We thank you for the love of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your divine presence. We thank you because you're God yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you because we can put our trust in you, know that you do all things well. We thank you, Lord, for every person that's in this congregation today. I pray that you speak to them, bless them, encourage them, and do great things in their life. And then I pray for every person who watches and listens, God, that you'd speak to them. Oh, God, we know that you're a God who meets the needs of your people. And, God, you came to meet the needs of the world. And so I just want to ask you today for your presence and your blessings and your anointing, and I'll thank you for it in Jesus' lovely name. Amen and amen. I want to speak to you today upon this thought introduction. I just want to introduce you to some people, right? I want to introduce you to some people. Uh, I'm sure you've met some of these before, but anyway, I want you to be introduced to them today. First of all, I want to introduce you to God the Father. Because in Genesis 1-1, you're introduced to God in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. So right there, we are introduced to God Almighty. The Bible don't say where God came from. Don't say anything about it, his character or nothing else except he's the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible goes on in Genesis 1 and says he created what he created was good. He saw it was good, very good. And I tell you, God is a good creator. He's a mighty creator. He's an everlasting creator. And so you can't find nothing wrong with him. And by the way, tell these evolutionists they better go back and read Genesis 1-1 because that makes them out a liar. They lie. That makes calls them a liar right there in Genesis 1-1. The very first verse in the Bible calls them a liar. Isn't that amazing? They're running around trying to teach our boys and girls in college and school that we evolved to what we are. That's a bunch of baloney. They need to read Genesis 1-1 and just see what God is. Well, introduce you to God the Father. He's the creator. Number two, I want to introduce you to Abel. The Bible said uh, Abel was the keeper of the sheep. You know, Adam and Eve had two sons here, and one of them was called Abel, and the Bible said he was a keeper of the sheep. The Bible talks about Cain. The Bible said he was a till of the ground. And, of course, Abel was a man of faith. He was a man that believed God. He was a man that put his confidence in God. He believed the word of God because, you see, uh, God had to kill an animal to clothe Adam and Eve. He had to shed blood. It's been blood all the way from the beginning, plumb all the way through. And so God has given us the blood upon the altar, he said, for the atonement for the soul. For it is the blood that makes the atonement for the soul. And so it's been blood ever since. And so Adam and Eve, you know, they were redeemed by blood. Abel believed that, and he offered a blood sacrifice. Cain offered the works of his hand. The works of your hands will never get you to heaven. If you're dependent upon your works, you'd just as well as to trash it because they'll take you down, down, down. And then there's Noah. The Bible talks about Noah. Let me introduce you to whole Noah. The Bible said when he was born, he was the son of Lamech. The Bible said, the same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the curse of the ground which the Lord God cursed. And so Noah was going to be a comfort. Of course, he was going to be a great comfort to, uh, of course, his family, of course, but then the world wouldn't believe. And we know that Noah was a man of righteousness, a man who preached the word of God and believed. And so we see Noah. But let me introduce you to another fellow. His name is Isaac. The Bible says in Genesis 17, God was talking to Abraham, and he said he was going to give him a son. He said, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his, with his seed after him. And so we know that Abraham, uh, God established his covenant with Abraham, gave him the Abrahamic covenant. He passed it on to Isaac, and then later on he passed it on to Jacob. And so he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You read that many times in the Word of God, and that's the reason because he's a covenant-keeping God. He will keep his covenant with Abraham. He will keep his covenant with Isaac. He will keep his covenant with Jacob. He will keep what he promises, folks. He will do it. He never goes back on a promise. And then there's Esau. You know, Esau, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 25, was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Uh, Esau represents a man of the world. He's a man who loves the world. He loves uh, to live in the world and uh, uh, survive in the world. Well, there's a lot of folks, that's what they are. They're men of the world. They live in the world. They don't have anything to do with God and not interested in God and those things. But the Bible said Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. That word plain means he was an undefiled man. He was an upright man. Jacob was an upright man. He sat on the knees of old Abraham, and Abraham told him about uh, the Abrahamic promise, and he sat on the knees of his father Isaac, no doubt he told him about that promise. And he believed God. He believed the promise of God. Oh, you see, Esau, he didn't have time for God. He didn't have time to go to church. He didn't have time to sit on Abraham's knee and listen to those great promises. He didn't have time to sit on Isaac's knee. No, he was too busy out there in the world hunting. 
And so that's the way a lot of folks are too busy to serve the living God. Oh, friend. And so let me introduce you to somebody else. Number eight, this is Moses. Let me introduce you to old Moses. Uh, you've heard about my little Moses. Let me introduce you to Moses. The Bible said when he was ch born, he was a goodly child. They looked at him and said he's a goodly child. Well, the Bible, uh, well, the Bible don't say, but they looked up that word goodly. It means beautiful. It means cheerful. It means joyful. It means loving and pleasant and uh, precious and uh, sweet. Well, old Moses was a sweet little baby, wasn't he? He was a pretty little old baby, and evidently he was a, a laughing baby. Uh, you've seen they had something on uh, TV not too awful long ago, this little old baby laughing and laughing and laughing. And Tammy's little old grandbaby, they sent us a, sent Carolyn a picture on her phone, and there's, uh, well, it might have been on Facebook. I don't know. I can't keep with all that stuff. But anyway, that little old grandson, I mean, Jay, he is a laugh, and there's a doing this, he is laughing and laughing. Well, I believe that's the way Moses was. He is a happy little old baby. He is a beautiful little old baby. Well, hey, God went on to make something beautiful out of his life, right? A lot of beautiful little old babies turn out to be wicked men and wicked uh, women, right? But, hey, they ought to go on and serve the living God. Yeah. Then let me introduce you, number nine, to Joshua. Oh, Joshua, the Bible said, well, he was a young man and followed Moses around, but then when the, his name is first used, the Bible said uh, Moses chose Joshua to go out and to fight with Amalek. He said, go out there and get some men to fight Amalek. Joshua, go out there and get some men to fight Amalek. Joshua didn't say, I ain't going to do it. You know what the Bible said? So Joshua did, as Moses had said unto him, and he went and followed Amalek. That was the life of Joshua. He was always doing what he was told to do. And, of course, he became the great leader of Israel and the commander-in-chief, right? Then let me introduce you to somebody else. There's a little fellow by the name of David. Well, when you find out about little David here, first of all, he physically, the Bible, you know not many people in the Bible described about the physical looks. We have nothing much about Jesus in the physical looks, right? But we do have a little bit about David. The Bible said he was the youngest of eight children of Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, and uh, David was the youngest one. Well, you say the Bible said another place seven. Well, one of them must have died. You know, you don't, sometimes people read that thing. They say there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, there's a contradiction in your interpretation. That's the problem. And then the Bible said he was ruddy. And, uh, and with all a beautiful countenance and a goodly person to look at. He was kind of red, reddish, you know. Uh, he may have had red hair. I don't know. You said Jews have red hair. I saw Jew had red hair. And so he must have maybe had red hair, but anyway, he is reddish. He had the reddish color. But he was a, he was a beautiful young man. But notice something else about him. The Bible said, 1 Samuel 16, that uh, the Bible said, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. There is... The commentary on his success. The Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. That makes all the difference in anybody's life is the Spirit of the living God. What can you do without the Spirit of God? You're like a big airplane sitting on the runway with no fuel in it if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, I introduce you to those in the way of introduction. Let me introduce you to some other folks here. You've met these folks, I'm sure. Let me introduce you first of all to Mr. Don't Care. <laughs> There's a lot of folk like that around, right? Mr. Don't Care, well, I'm not interested in anything you have to say. I'm not interested in your tracts. I'm not interested in your Bible. I'm not interested in your religion. I met a few of those folks along the way, right? Have you ever met any of them folk? You'll find them out there, Mr. Don't Care. They don't care what you say about Jesus Christ. They don't care what you've experienced. They don't care about your tracts. They don't care about your Bible. They don't care nothing about Jesus Christ. You know what's going to happen to them in the hell? They're going to lift their eyes and cry like the old rich man in Luke 16. But it'll be too late then. I'm telling you, folks, I'm glad one day I sat on the Word of God and I got a care in my heart. I did care, brother. I did care. I do care where I'm going, don't you? I care about my soul. They don't seem to be care about their soul. Hey, you better care about your soul. You've got a soul that's going to live on and on and on and on and on. Somebody said, when I die, that's the end of me. No, that's not the end of you. That's just the beginning of you. Well, I know you've been here maybe 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, how many years you've been here, but I'm telling you, eternity starts for you, and you're going to be there somewhere forever, either in heaven or hell. And so, Mr. Don't Care, oh, hey, I hope you do care, right? I hope you do care about your soul. I hope you do care about where you're going to spend eternity. I do hope you care about that, because if you don't, you're in sad, sad shape. I want to say, number two, let me introduce you to somebody else. You've met him, too, I'm sure, Mr. Procrastinator. 
Well, you know, I, I, I know now, preacher, I know what I ought to do. I know I ought to get right. I know I ought to get saved, and I know I ought to go to church, and I know I ought to live right, but I'm not ready. You know, I've had old people to tell me that. I've had people 80 year old to tell me, I'm not ready. I said, Lord, how mercy, when are you going to get ready? You got one foot on a banana peel and the other in the grave, and you're saying, I'm not ready. I mean, you're on the precipice of eternity, on the very precipice of hell itself, and saying, I'm not ready. When are you going to get ready? Today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow you could be in eternity. Tomorrow you might be in hell, lifting your eyes like the rich man. Hey, today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. Give your heart to Christ now, today, today. Because if you don't, you could be lost and lost forever. I remember the story that was told about these farmers out in the Midwest going across, you know, reaping the fields, the great wheat fields of the Midwest. And all the farmers were working together, you know, and they're going together and reaping the fields, coming to them, and they came to this one field up. It wasn't time to quit, but it maybe in the latter part of the day, and they had time to do a lot of the field. If they had, maybe they had finished it, I don't know, but they said, let's just wait till tomorrow. Let's just wait till tomorrow. And that night, a great storm came. The next morning they got up and all that wheat was laying on the ground. It's too late. Procrastination is a thief of time. You see, you don't have to do anything real bad to go to hell. All you got to do is just do nothing. Do nothing, do nothing. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Mr. Procrastinator, I've got plenty of time. Some other time, preacher. Some other time, church. Some other time, Jesus. Some other time, God, I don't want to do it now. I got plenty of time. That's what you don't have much of is time. I want to say number three, let me introduce you to Mr. Do Good. <laughs> Mr. Do Good. He thinks that he's going to heaven because uh, he does good. He's a person always doing good. He, he's, uh, I don't drink and I don't cuss and don't do drugs. and You know, I don't do all them other things. I don't uh, run around on my wife. I work hard. I pay my bills. I'm doing good. <laughs> what else do I need to do? You need to get saved. That's what you need to do. You need to surrender your heart to Christ. Without Christ, you can't go to heaven. And so a lot of folks want to do good, you know. They say, I paid my debts, and, you know, I tend to my own business. I don't bother my neighbor. Don't bother anybody. Don't gossip. Sound like a pretty good person, but you know what? That's not good enough to take you to heaven. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. The only thing that can wash your sins away is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's darling son. And if you don't trust him to wash your sins away, brother, you'll be lost and lost forever. And so there's Mr. Do Good. Let me introduce you, number four, to Mr. Have a Good Time. You ever met him? Have a Good Time. Well, I'm too young I, I, to give my heart to Jesus. I've got too much living to do. I've got to kick up my heels and have a good time. Hey, you know what, uh, uh, Mr. Goodtime, you know, he, uh, he likes to party and he likes to drink and he likes to dance and he likes to live in the light, the bright lights, the nightlife. He likes the nightlife. He likes to go to the pop concerts and, the, and the, you know, the rock concerts and all them big concerts. He likes to kick up his heel and have a good time. And, boy, I can't, I can't uh, go to church and get serious of God. I'm having too good a time. I wonder what happens when old man death calls knocking on your door. All you got to do is look in the obituary and you see people every day that's young. They're too young to die, right? right. Oh, brother, I'm telling you, it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. But they don't seem to have time. they uh, just uh, looking for a good time. They're uh, pleasure seekers, you might say. Seeking pleasure, hey, brother, there's pleasure in Christ. There's joy unspeakable in serving God. You talk about joy, and when you get up the next day, you won't have a hangover neither. That's the thing about coming to Jesus Christ and get saved by the grace of God. When you get up the next morning, you ain't going to have a hangover. Brother, when you, you get drunk and have a, all those things, you get up the next morning, you don't know what you've done or where you've been, and you have a hangover, got a big headache, and you're vomiting your head off, that's not too good, is it? We're having a good time. Yeah, what are you doing? Getting drunk? Well, what are, you, what are you doing when you get drunk? Yeah. <laughs> You're really having a good time, ain't you? Can't remember? You're just getting high and sick as a buzzard and all that stuff. Well, there's Mr. Good Time. Number five, let me introduce you to Mr. Playboy. Here's a Playboy. You ever met any of them? 
He's addicted to playing the field. He's addicted to, you know, sleeping around, sleeping with everybody. One fellow said, oh, there's too many women out there, boy. I, he said, there's too many women out there. Yeah, there's a lot of women out there. But their path is down to hell. Their path is going down, 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 down. Uh, you see, he don't think it's sin to commit fornication. Mr. Playboy, he don't think it's wrong to sleep around. He don't think it's wrong to hop in bed with everybody. Hey, when he wakes up to age, he'll think it's pretty bad. When he wakes up with some venereal disease, he'll think it's pretty bad. Hey, when he wakes up with some of these other things going on, he'll think it's pretty bad. But, you know, he, he just... Uh, is addicted to this sin, and he don't think he's going to have to give an account to God. These people don't have to, they don't think they're going to have to give an account to God. They're promoting it on TV. You know, they think they're not going to have to give an account to God, but the Bible said every thought that we have, we're going to have to give an account, and every word that we speak, we'll have to give an account on the day of judgment. God knows so much about you, he counts every step you take. God knows so much about you that he counts every hair on your head. He knows a whole lot about you. He knows more about you than you know yourself. The Bible said the heart is secret above all things and desperately weak. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give every man according to the fruit of his labor and according to the fruit of his doing. My soul in Jesus' name. One day they're going to have to give an account and wonder what they're going to tell of God in that day. Mr. Playboy. He likes to play around. I've met a few of them. You see a lot of them on TV, right? They promote that stuff on TV. Then number six, let me introduce you to Miss Jezebel. <laughs> Y'all know Miss Jezebel, don't you? <laughs> I can't leave Miss Jezebel out, right? Miss Jezebel, well, she's loud and stubborn. The Bible said in the book of Proverbs, you know, she's loud and stubborn. She's domineering. She's full of pride, not a humble bone in her body. <laughs> she's against God, right? She's against the work of God. She's against the prophets of God. She had uh, Nabal killed. And the prophets of God killed. In the book, she likes to call herself a prophetess. She says, I'm a prophetess. And the Bible said she uh, uh, teaches them to seduce my servants and to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, she's leading people astray. It's bad enough to go astray yourself, but when you lead other people astray, that's doubly bad, triply bad, a thousand times bad, brother, when you do that. She was an idolater. You know, if you're not having Jesus, first of all, then you're an adult. If you've got anything between you and God, that's a, that's a God to you. If it's sports, if it's money, if it's fame, if it's whatever it may be, if it's between you and God, you love it more than you do Jesus Christ, then the Bible said that's a God to you. And so you're an idolater. You say, preacher, you're too hard. No, I'm just preaching the blessed word of God. Just introducing you to these folks so you'll know them when you meet them, right? Then number seven, there's Mr. Unbelief. They call themselves, they call themselves atheists, infidels. They got a name, the freedom from religion crowd. You heard about them? Trying to sue everybody that mentioned Jesus or has anything to do with God. We need to pray that crowd out of business, folks. I'm telling you, it's time the church get on their knees and call out to God and pray against that crowd like Elijah prayed against Israel. They're trying to put God's people out of business, trying to put the church out of business, trying to do everything that's wrong. I'm telling you, brother, that crowd is a bunch of atheists. And God needs to wait in on that crowd and let them know that he's God Almighty because he is God, isn't he? The Bible said he's a fool that says in his heart there's no God. That's a bunch of fools. Old B.R. Lincoln's on an airplane one day and uh, he was reading his Bible and that fellow beside him said, you believe that? He said, yeah, I believe that. He said, well, I don't believe it. He said, that's a funny thing. I saw your name in there. <laughs> He said, you didn't see my name in there. Oh, yeah, I did. I saw your name in there. He said, where is he? He said, well, the, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. <laughs> He's a fool. <laughs> That's what you call me, a fool. He's a fool. He's a fool. Okay, let me give you some things. Well, uh, you know, they, they ignore what this one thing. Prophecy proves the Bible to be the Word of God. This Bible right here is God's Word. And prophecy proves it beyond every shadow of a doubt. The Bible says it's a light in a dark place. The psychics, they can't prophesy. The false prophets, they can't prophesy. Them false prophets was prophesying in the days of Jeremiah, and they said, oh, in a few years, you're going to get out of Babylon. Jeremiah said, don't believe them. They're going to be down there 70 years. They're lying. They're lying, you know. And, of course, there's a lot of other false prophets in the Bible. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, Old fool, slow heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
You're a fool not to believe all this Bible, all the prophets have spoken. It's going to come to pass. Every jot, every tittle will come to pass just as God said it. Hey, hey, brother, you better believe it. Thank God for the precious word of God. Let me give you just a few things about a fool right quick. I've got plenty of time. I thought I was running out of time, but I'm flying here today. I like that flying, don't you? Don't have you listen hard and close, and then I get it all to you in just a few minutes, package it up real close, you know. Proverbs 1 7, the Bible said, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I don't know about you. I want wisdom. The Bible said, He that walks with the wise will be wise. He that walks with fools is going to be a fool. I want to walk with the wise, don't you? The Bible said again, the fools hate knowledge. Fools hate knowledge. They hate the knowledge of God. They don't want nothing to do with the knowledge of God. Then the Bible says again in Proverbs 10, fools die for want of wisdom. Fools die for want of wisdom. They die and go to hell because they don't have any wisdom. Wisdom begins when you begin to fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Bible said again, Proverbs 12, the Bible said, the, fool, uh, the heart of the fool proclaimeth foolishness. The heart of the fool proclaims foolishness. I mean, he's got a foolish heart. He's got a foolish head. <laughs> he thinks wrong and his heart proclaims to him foolish things. He believes the lies of his own heart. They said Raymond Queen, who was a song leader at Welcome Hill Baptist Church, church I grew up in. Just, they built it just across the road from my house. And I used to listen to Raymond tell some different things. And he said, this one old fellow, he's trying to get in this cafe, you know. And, and said he opened the door and said, here, somebody go out and somebody go in. said, he just kept standing there and just kept, people kept going in front of that, you know, and he couldn't get in that. Said finally he hollered back and said, there's a fountain of blood squirting 50 feet high up on the square. He said everybody in that place run out of there. And said he walks in there and sits down on his food. He said that's why people come in there and said, there's a fountain of blood squirting 100 feet high up on, the, up on the square. And said he jumped up and ran up there to see. He told the lie and believed his own lie. Ain't that sad? That's the way folks are. They believe their own lie. He said again in the book of Proverbs 13, he said, it's an abomination of fools to depart from evil. I mean, it's an abomination of them to depart from evil. They love evil so well. They love wickedness so good. They won't give it up. They, it's a sin for them to depart from it. And God said to repent of it. And yet they love it so good. If you love darkness so good, God will let you live in darkness forever. He's going to cast you in the outer darkness let you live there forever. The Bible said fools make a mock at sin. They scoff and say, you old crazy Baptist, you fundamentalist, you believe this is sin and that's sin, and they mock at sin. Wonder what they're going to say to God Almighty when God accuses them of all their wickedness. The Bible said again, the mouth of the fools pour out, poureth out foolishness. I listen to that freedom of religion crowd. It makes me so mad I could bite this thing right here in two. <laughs> Hey, God wants us to be diligent for the truth. Value it for the truth, don't he? Okay, Mr. Unbelief. Okay, Mr. Number eight, this only me to introduce you to Mr. Deceived. This Mr. Deceived. Well, he thinks his religion's right. He's got religion. He thinks it's right. He does not believe in Jesus Christ. He don't believe in Christ, but he thinks his religion's the right way. He believes his rituals. And his uh, works and his prayers are going to take him to heaven. If he even believes in heaven, some of them don't even believe in heaven. They just believe it's going to get them through a good life. But I'm telling you, friend, that won't work, will it? Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If he's not in your heart, you don't have a hope of heaven. You don't even have a hope. If you have a hope, it's a false hope. Look in your heart today. Is Christ living in you? If he's not... I want you to know, I want you to know and understand you have a false hope if you think you're going to heaven, if you think you're right with God, if you think your religion's taking you to heaven, I'm telling you, you believe in a lie, that lie's going to take you straight to hell. You better check up Christ in you, the hope of glory. You better believe that because if you don't, you're in trouble. Then I want to say, let me pass on quickly and say number nine, let me induce you to Mr. Unsure. Professes to be saved. He's a church member. He's been baptized. He's a tither. He works in the church maybe, but he does not have the assurance of salvation. Oh, I, I, I do all this? Ain't that good enough? <laughs> if you hadn't been saved, it ain't. I listen to Billy Graham pretty much almost every Saturday night. 
And he always throws this out if you don't know for sure about your soul salvation. I listened to him last night, and he said, almost on every crusade, we'll have a preacher come down. Not sure about their salvation. Isn't that something? There's a lot of people sitting on church pews. They made a profession, but they really didn't get saved. Because, see, when you get saved, there's a change. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. <laughs> you become new. You become a new person. Things turn around. I mean, glory to God. Brother Matthew was talking about yesterday on our visitation. He said uh, when he got saved, he said before he got saved, he had uh, just a umpty dumpty CDs and DVDs. You know, the worldly singers, I guess. He said thousands of dollars. And he said, you know, I walked in that little room there before the day before I got saved and said, man, that was a that was an ideal place. But said when I got saved, next day I walked in there and it's just like I was in a strange place. And I said, the Lord said, you need to get rid of that. And they said, Lord, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's what that old flesh will say. You know, that's what the old devil will say. That's a lot of money. But he had to get rid of it. You see, that's what the that's what the Lord will do. He'll change your heart. He'll change your desires. He changes your direction. That's one way you know you're saved by the wonderful grace of God. Oh, yes. Mr. Unsure, he don't have the assurance of salvation. Well, you say, how do you get that? Well, you believe and trust in Jesus Christ with all your heart and all your soul. He said, search the scripture for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that t testify of me. Search the scriptures. The Bible said, uh, he that believes overcometh the world, and this is the faith that overcometh the world. You see, the way, the way that you know you're saved, you overcome the world. You're an overcomer. I mean, the mainspring of your life is once in a while you may succumb to temptation. The devil may tempt you. You may fall. But you know what? You're going to get up and repent. You're going to run back to Jesus. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But if you keep walling in that sin, you keep on in that sin. The Bible said they went out from us that it might be manifested they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they, may have, they would have continued with us. You see, people might, when they get saved, might fall. Hey, but you know what they're going to do? They're going to get up. Amen, you know what? You can take an old sheep out there and kick him off in the mud hole, and he's going to jump up and shake himself. Yep. You take an old pig out there, kick him off in the mud hole, he's going to, mm -hmm. boy, this feels so good. Right. You know what the difference is? One of them's a pig, one of them's a sheep. A saint of God, he may fall, but you know what he's going to do? He's not going to run away from God. He's not going to quit church. He's not going to get mad at God, get them mad at the uh, Christians. He's not preaching to everybody else. He's going to repent. He's going to find his way back to God Almighty. Mr. Unsure, could I introduce you to the last one, number 10? Got to introduce you to Jesus Christ. Can you stay with me a few more minutes? In Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel introduced him. And this is what he said about him. He's the son of the highest. Murray, you're going to have a son. And he's going to be called the son of the highest. He's going to be the son of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful if everybody in the world would believe that? The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's what them Jews have been looking for all the time. Isn't that amazing? Right there on the nose, right there in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem, right where the Bible said he was going to be born. Right on the nose. And yet they rejected him. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. You say, well, he don't have a kingdom. Oh, yeah, he does. He has a spiritual kingdom right now. Right? You are saved in that spiritual kingdom. Don't misunderstand what I'm taking and run off and say, well, that, pre that preacher's crazy. One day he's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to rule over the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, right? He's going to reign for 1,000 years. Of course, he's going to reign forever and ever in eternity. Then I want you to notice again what the shepherds were revealed, the angel revealed to the shepherds on the hillside. And he said in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, Unto you is born this day in the city of David as Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's not only the Son of God and the Son of the Highest, and He's the Son of David, but He's the Savior. He's the Savior. He's the Savior, Christ the Lord. He's the Messiah. He's not only the Messiah, the Son of David, but He is a Savior. You know what a Savior is, don't you? Somebody who saves. This is what old John the Baptist said about Him. I'm introducing Jesus to you. 
Now, I know I can't begin to induce all the things about him, but I'll just give you some of the good things. Uh, you know the first things about him. John chapter 1, verse 34, and I saw in my record that this is the Son of God. Amen. Oh, John the Baptist, not a greater man born. The Bible said Jesus said not a greater man born than John the Baptist. And you know what John said about him? He is the Son of God. I bear record, he's the Son of God. He knew he was the son of God. The one that sent him to baptize told him and how you know him. And he said, I bear record, this is the son of God. John chapter 1, as I read to you a moment ago, took me all this time to get back to my text. What about that? Well, listen to what it said. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Introducing Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of the Highest, the Son of David, the Messiah, the Savior, the one, the Lamb of God. He points back to the Passover Lamb. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He'll take your sins away. He'll take my sins away. He'll take everybody's sins away that will believe him and trust him. He'll take, a, uh, take away the sin of the Jew and the sin of the Gentiles, the sin of the black, the red, the yellow, the brown, the white. He takes away anybody and everybody's sins that will believe in him. You want your sins taken care of? Then go to Jesus. Brother Mike helped some of you with these tickets. Right? <laughs> he knows some folk. Can help you sometimes. Well, Jesus knows God the Father. <laughs> he can take care of them sins. Listen to what God the Father said about him. I'm talking about Jesus, introducing Jesus to you. Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This he said it is baptizing. As Jesus has been baptized, come up out of the water, cloud came over and a voice rang out from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God said this is my son. And he said I'm pleased in him. I, he is, uh, I'm well pleased in him. Can God say that about you that he's pleased with you? Oh, I want him to be pleased with me, don't you? That we may please him. No man that wasn't taken to himself with the fires of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. I want to please him, don't you? Matthew 17, 5. This is on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. This is when he's transfigured before them a cloud came over and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. You want to, you want to find out the truth? Believe and trust in him. Hear what Jesus has to say. You'll find out the truth, right? This is what John the, the Beloved said. John the Beloved, as he introduced Jesus and John, he said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was good, all things were made by him, without him was not anything made. He was in the world, and the world knew him not. He's the creator. He's the one that stood there in Genesis 1 and said, let him be. What about that? This is what he said in John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you trust Christ and put your faith in Christ, you'll have everlasting life. Have you done that today? Can you say, I've done that, preacher? I know I have everlasting life. Let me go on and read the verse 17. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came to save the world. I heard Charles Stanley preaching. I think the sermon he preached on the radio was one that played on TV today. How many saw his TV sermon? Lot, several of you. Well, he was saying yesterday, as I was riding down the road, he said, God just didn't save you to save you from hell. But he saved you, saved you to save you from sin. Well, that's true, partly true. But he saved you to fellowship with you. He loves you. He wants to fellowship with me and you. Do you know that? He wants us to fellowship with him. He wants our fellowship. Can you imagine a God in heaven wanting to fellowship with us little old earthlings? But he loved you so much and he saved you so you could fellowship with him. You could never fellowship with him were you not saved. You see, lost folks, they can't fellowship with him. They're blind. They can't see and they don't know. Oh, beloved, he said the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, if you don't believe and trust in Christ, you're condemned already. I mean, you're hanging out over hell, and that old devil, he's a swing at that thread that's trying to hold you up. That devil's swinging. He's, he's got his old big sword trying to swing, cut that thread. The only thing that's keeping you from dropping into hell is the good grace of God. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
Oh, beloved, you better believe upon him. Put your faith in Christ today. Put your trust in Christ. Look at what Peter said about him. Look at what Peter said. Just give me a few more minutes, okay? John chapter 6. He said, for, for that time, many of his disciples went back. He said, Jesus, except eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Oh, that's a hard saying for them. They, they left him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go? Then Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Who can you go to if you don't go to Jesus? Can you go to all these other religions? Can you go to the Muslim religion, the Buddhist religion, or the Baha'i religion, all these other religions? Can they give you eternal life? Can the atheists give you eternal life? Can the unbelievers and the, uh, the wicked folk, can they give you eternal life? There's only one person that can give you eternal life, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you reject him, you reject eternal life. You, re you rejected your only hope of salvation. And we believe in our sure. This is what Peter said. And we believe in our sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, we know that. We assure that. Oh, I'm sure too, aren't you? Well, look what Jesus said about himself. I'm trying to introduce Jesus to you. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door of the sheep. He said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I am the Son of God. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I'm the true vine. You know what else he said? You believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You've got to believe he's the one. You would not come to me that you might have life. You would not come. A lot of folks won't come to Jesus that they might have life. I don't know about you. I choose life. Moses said, I sit before your life and death. This day I sit before your life and death, a blessing and a curse. He said, choose life that you may live and your children may live. You know the reason a lot of kids are going to go to hell? Because their parents chose to go to hell themselves. They chose to live in sin. They chose not to take their kids to church. They chose not to live right. They chose not to believe the Bible. They chose some false way, some false religion. They chose something to make them feel good. They would not repent of their sins. They would not turn from their sins. They chose the wickedness of the devil, the lie of the devil. I choose life. I choose God's blessings. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us in the service tonight. Oh, beloved, you know, we're close to eternity, every one of us. We're getting closer every day. We're not getting farther away from eternity. We're getting closer. That's the reason we need to live for God and serve God and be in the house of God and draw nigh to Him each and every day. And, oh, beloved, are you saved? If I should be able to ask you personally, are you saved? Could you say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I know that I know that I'm saved. If you can't, you might ought to bow your head right where you're at and pray the sinner's prayer and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. I know that I'm lost. I know I'm undone. I, I know I need to repent, and so I'm coming to you, Lord Jesus, confessing my sins and turning from my sins. By your grace and by your help, I'm going to live for you from this day forward. Oh, beloved, just pray that simple prayer. Repent of your sins. Put your faith in Christ. Make that commitment to Christ right now. Turn to him with all of your heart. Find your place in the house of God. Live in for Jesus. Be baptized and read that Bible every day and live for Jesus and witness for him and pray to him and trust him because soon, beloved, you will be in eternity. I will be too. And so, hey, I choose to serve him. What about you? I choose to go with God, and God's way is always the best way. You can never, you can never improve on the way of God, on God's grace and God's mercy. You can never improve on it. And so you just need to come to him. If you need further prayer, call that number. If you need further counsel, call that number. If you'd like to write, the address will be there. We'd be thrilled to hear from you. And so do take the time to write or do take the time to call. And so it means a great deal to us to know that you're there receiving a blessing from the Bible Hour. Also, let me invite you to come and be with us right here to Zion Baptist Church in South Gastonia, just two blocks off of 321 South, a block and a half off the Neil Hawkins Road, three and a half miles from I-85. If you're traveling Interstate 85, get off at exit number 17. 17, almost forgot to exit 17, and go down 321, three and a half miles, and there we are on your left over Bush Street. Leo Kirkendall, I got to go. See you next week. God bless you.